Hi everyone, and welcome back to the Dark History Podcast. Hope everybody is well. I'm Rob, your host as always. Episode 15, can't believe it. It seems a lifetime ago I published my first episode way back in January. Scary how time flies. Since then, the show is so close to having 10,000 individual plays, which is insane. And also, the show has had its first episode reach a 1,000 plays, which is unreal. I'm so grateful to you all. Thank you so much. Episode 15 is something that, up until a few months ago, I'd never heard of. I don't think I've ever seen too much of it on YouTube or any other podcast. Just before we do start this, a couple of things to warn you about, or maybe just mention to you. I will be talking about Nazis, Hitler, the SS, and the Holocaust. It can be a sore subject, and I am in no way trying to glorify or condone their actions. They are a big part of this story, and any time they're mentioned is the purpose of context. That's all. The next is to do with talking about Jewish people, and what, in my experience, generally comes with that. And that is the Free Palestine Agenda. Honestly, I can't see what these stories have in common. I covered this on my TikTok a couple of months ago and couldn't believe the amount of anti-Semitism there is. Now, I have my own views on the Israel-Palestine debate, but I find the whole thing very flammable. So please keep the two separate. With all that out the way, please enjoy episode 15. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth is a phrase that we've all heard. Its use stretches back some 4,000 years, when it was coined in ancient Babylon by King Hammurabi. Well, our tale revolves around this moral conundrum. Our tale sees a wildly ambitious plot. Our tale sees revenge on a giant scale. Retribution for an event that saw millions die, and permanently spread a blackness over this era in human history. This tale is of Nakam and the Jewish Avengers. So without further ado, please sit back and relax for more Dark History. If there was ever an event in time that demanded retribution, it was the Holocaust. Taking place between 1941 and 1945, a scale of horror previously not seen by humankind was unfolding. Yes, people will point to China and the USSR throughout the 20th century for their part in mass murder and genocide, but neither come close to the industrial slaughter that was unfolded in Nazi-held Europe. Germany was systematically murdering Jews, Roma, disabled people, etc., to wipe these people from the earth. And at the end of all this carnage, would see an estimated 11 million men, women and children die. Six million of these people being Jewish. These people would succumb to the gas chambers that were purposely built to gobble up as many lives as it could. Others were shot and pushed into pits, while others were carried away by starvation or disease. As Allied forces raced across Europe, they would soon encounter the depravity of the camps. There is a contentious debate regarding just how much the governments of the Allied nations knew before their men stumbled across the horrors of the German death camps. The Red Cross visited in 1944. Granted, this was a watered-down, sanitised version to the abject horror contained in the fences of Auschwitz, Dachau and Bergen-Belsen. When the Second World War drew to a close, All the atrocities of the Nazi party were laid bare in a series of trials, held in the German city of Nuremberg. These trials saw the top 24 Nazis that were still alive, and that could be found on trial. A further 12 trials saw a total of 199 people face the courts. Of this 199 people, 161 were convicted, with 37 sentenced to death. But unfortunately, those numbers pale into comparison to the vastness killed in the camps. 
the fires of revenge began burning before World War II was at an end. There was countless reports of rogue squads of the Jewish brigades that were executing German officers who had returned home, with the hope to blend into obscurity. Now, there aren't any definitive numbers on how many German officers were assassinated at the hands of the Jewish brigades, but historians estimate a hundred men were killed in this way. Then, you have the Jewish partisans, many of whom had fought the Germans clandestinely, but now hit out at the once feared German hierarchy. Again, it's impossible to know the numbers of men who received a knock at the door in the middle of the night, who would be bewilderedly bungled into the back of a waiting car, never to be seen again. And yet these acts of revenge were minuscule in comparison to the six million that had been taken. What was needed was reprisals of spectacular and horrific proportions. Reprisals that wouldn't be limited to the odd Nazi officer, but completely wipe them and their whole families out. A reprisal that would take an eye for an eye. The man who would attempt to bring this retribution is a man who is considered to be one of the greatest poets in modern day Israel. His name, Abba Kovna. Kovna was born in 1918 in the city of Ashmanyen in Belarus. When war broke out, the young Kovna had moved to the city of Vilnius, the capital of Lithuania. At the time, Lithuania had been in the clutches of the Soviets, but was taken by Hitler when he broke his non-aggression pact he had signed with Stalin. No sooner had the swastika been raised, the Germans began pushing the Jewish people into the Vilna ghetto situated in Vilnius's Jewish quarter in the heart of the city. By 1942, a pamphlet and manifesto had begun circulating the ghettos. This pamphlet uttered the words of Abba Krovna and his message of resistance. This message of resistance would somehow fall on deaf ears and would only gain minimal support. But it did bring about the formation of the United Partisan Organization with the brooding and charismatic Kovna becoming one of its leaders. The organization would become one of the first to be founded in a Nazi-controlled ghetto. Unfortunately, any plot or action taken by the organization would be met with draconian retribution from the Nazis, a fact that would eventually cause the populace to turn their back on the partisans. Throughout 1942 and 1943, thousands of Jews were shipped out of the ghettos, usually to their immediate deaths. By 1943, the ghetto was liquidated, and the last of the Jewish people had been loaded onto trucks and shipped out. But they didn't get everyone. As the trucks rumbled overhead, Kovner and three others crept through the sewage system and emerged on the outskirts of the city. They may have been covered in excrement and been pelted with driving rain that night, but they were safe. Unfortunately, they would sleep that night with the thoughts of their families and how they would never see them again. By 1944, Kovner and his small band of partisans, then known as the Nok Mim, or Avenger, in Hebrew, were hiding out in the forests around Vilnius. They were embroiled in a guerrilla war against the Nazis and anyone associated with them. Unfortunately, like a lot of obscure bits of history, very little is known about the group, with one exception, and that is the Konyuchi Massacre. The village of Konyuchi had formed its own armed self-defence force, with the encouragement of the German-sponsored Lithuanian Auxiliary Police. This self-defence force stood against the partisans, who were frequently accused of theft. Now what actually happened, and who took part, remains far from clear. But a partisan log states that at least 38 civilians were killed. The log goes on to mention Jewish partisan groups, including the Nokmim. The massacre would never be fully investigated until 2006, but it was met with outcries of anti-Semitism and victim blaming. Even today, the events of the 29th of January 1944 are fiercely contested. 
One thing that is strikingly clear is whether it be Nazi or partisan, all sides committed atrocities and it was far from black and white. After the liberation of Lithuania by the Red Army, Kovna and his group moved their way to Bucharest, one of the stops for Jews fleeing to Palestine. Here, Kovna would meet survivors of the death camps. These people would paint terribly horrific pictures for the members of Nokmim, a picture that surely consumed the families and loved ones. With the words of the survivors ringing in their ears, the passion for revenge began to burn higher. In one of Kovna's fiery speeches, he declared the only way the Jewish people could be at peace would be if six million Germans were killed in retaliation for the Holocaust. Nowadays, this sort of retribution may sound difficult to comprehend, but none of us can really judge. Bar a very select few, none of us have actually seen the horrors of Auschwitz, and none of us lost our entire families through the barbaric cruelty that was the gas chambers. The 50 or so members of Nokmim who listened to Kovner's speech that night were intensely enthusiastic about the great revenge plan. They would agree that six million would be the price Germany would have to pay. Not in money, but in souls. So how do you kill six million people? Yes, the Germans did it a few years earlier, during the war. But the world was at peace now, and despite their denials, the Allies were desperate to extradite themselves from the responsibilities of the web that was tens of thousands of German soldiers held in several camps. As I alluded to earlier, nearly 200 Nazis faced trials in Nuremberg, because they were the worst, but most of the other 10,000 people would leave scot-free. It was far too time-consuming to process and convict them all. The Avengers, well, their mandate stretch further than the bloodiest of hands. They wanted to make all of them suffer. They would go after the families, the friends, they would go after everyone. How did they plan to do this? The author. Plan A, a very original name, revolves around poisoning the water supplies of several German cities. The Avengers felt they had the best possible chance of killing the millions they so desperately desired. After the Allied bombing raids, German cities lay in ruin. Their electricity and water supplies also were a complete mess. If the Avengers could infiltrate this mess, they would have direct access to infect the supply with poison, and in just the right places, the effects could be catastrophic. They started by dispatching teams to poor German cities. Though Nuremberg is the only city that we have concrete evidence for, The Avengers tried to see if this was feasible. It fell to Kovner to obtain the poison, easier said than done, from the leaders in the Yishuv, the Jewish leadership in mandated Palestine. In July 1945, Kovner disguised himself as a Jewish brigade soldier on leave and boarded a ship for Palestine. Shortly after he arrived in the land that would become Israel, Kovner was arrested by Mossad agents. He was held for three days in an apartment and personally interrogated by Mossad chief Shal Mirov. After his release, Kovner negotiated with Hagnana chiefs Moshe Shnen and Israel Galilee in hopes of convincing them to give him poison for a small revenge operation in return for not linking the murder to the Yishuv, but they refused. With the procurement of the poison being somewhat frustrating for Kovner, he sent word back to Europe to start laying the groundworks on Plan B. More on that later. Kovner would get a breakthrough when he was introduced to Ephraim and Aaron Kahadzir, chemists at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, who were able to connect him with the head of the chemical storage facility at the university, who was willing to supply him with the poison. In Nuremberg, the stage was set. Through the use of bribes, the group managed to place Willex Schinner, an engineer from Krakow who spoke fluent German, in a position with the municipal water company. Schinner obtained the plans for the water system and controls of the main water valves, and plotted where the poison should be introduced, so as to kill the largest possible number of Germans. 
Now all they needed was the poison. After several delays, Kovner travelled to Alexandria, Egypt in December of 1945. Carrying false papers that identified him as a Jewish brigade soldier returning from leave and a duffel with gold hidden in toothpaste tubes and cans full of poison. Shortly after boarding a ship heading to Toulon, France, Kovner's name along with three others was called over the public address system. Kovner told a friend, Yitzhak Rosenkrant, to convey the duffel to Paris and then threw half of the poison overboard. After this, he turned himself in and was arrested by the British police. Nakam, as the group had become known, later claimed that Kovna had been betrayed by the Haganah. Kovna, who spoke no English, had not attended the Jewish brigade training, was not questioned about Nakam, and after two months in jail in Egypt and Palestine, he was released. His involvement in Nakam ended at the time. His plan had failed. Because Kovner had not managed to secure the quantity of poison required, the Nuremberg cell decided to switch to plan B. Firstly, most of the Nakam action groups disbanded as ordered and their members dispersed into displaced persons camps, promised by the leaders that in the future they would be reactivated to implement plan A. The cells near Nuremberg and Dachau remained active because of the large US prisoner of war camp nearby. Why did they need to be near these camps? Well, Plan B involved poisoning SS prisoners. As most of you will know, the once dreaded SS was Hitler's paramilitary organisation. The SS would take Nazism to a whole new level, and was broadly responsible for the final solution. The Allies would allow a lot of the Wehrmacht soldiers to return home to civilian life, but the ideological nutcases that were the SS members were locked away. Ironically, these monsters were held in the very camps that they murdered millions in. The camps at Dachau and Nuremberg housed upwards of 15,000 prisoners by this point. When laying the groundwork for Plan B, a chemist named Yitzhak Ratner was recruited into the group to obtain poison locally. In October of 1945, he set up a laboratory in the Cam headwaters in Paris where he tested various formulations in order to find a tasteless, odourless poison that would have delayed effects. Ratner eventually formulated a mixture of arsenic, glue and other additives which could be painted onto loaves of bread. Tests on cats proved the lethality of the mixture. He obtained more than 18 kilograms, or 40 pounds, of arsenic from friends who worked in the training industry which was smuggled into Germany. Most of the Narcan forces were on the Langwasser internment camp near Nuremberg, which housed mainly former SS officers or prominent Nazis. Initially, two Narcan members were hired by the camp, one as a driver and the other as a star worker. The bread for Langwasser came from a single bakery in Nuremberg named the Consumer Cooperative Bakery. Honestly, the German name had a 24-letter word in it, and I'm not reading that. I can't read that. A survivor of several Nazi concentration camps posed as a Polish displaced person, waiting for a visa to work at his uncle's bakery in Canada. He asked the manager if he could work for free and eventually secured access to the bakery storeroom after bribing him with cigarettes, alcohol and chocolate. The Narcan operatives met each night in a rented room in Foot to discuss their findings, especially how to confine their attack to German prisoners and avoid harming the American guards. When the Avengers placed a few of the workers in clerical positions in the camp, they discovered that on Sundays, the black bread would be eaten by the German prisoners because the American guards were specially issued with white bread. Therefore, they decided to execute the attack on a Saturday night. Similar preparations were made with regards to the prison camp near Dachau and the bakery that supplied it. With an effort led by Warsaw Ghetto Uprising veteran Simcha Rotem, after becoming friends with Poles who worked in the bakery, Rotem got the manager drunk, made copies of his keys and returned them before he sobered up. 
A few days before the planned attack, Rotem received a tip-off from a Jewish intelligence officer in the United States Army that two of his operatives were wanted by the police. As ordered, the Dachau Nyakam operatives abandoned on the 11th of April 1946. Rotem feared that the failure of one attack would cause the US to increase its security measures at the prison camps, preventing a second attack. By this time though, six Narcan members were working in the bakery in Nuremberg. Subverting tight security aimed to prevent the theft of food, they smuggled the arsenic in over a several day period, hiding it under raincoats and stashing it beneath the floorboards. Because experiments had shown that the arsenic mixture did not spread evenly, the operatives decided to paint it onto the bottom of each loaf. On Saturday the 13th of April, the bakers working were on strike. As a result, the three men tasked with poisoning the bread only coated 3,000 loaves instead of 14,000 as originally planned. After painting the loaves, they fled to Czechoslovakia, helped out by an Auschwitz survivor named Yehud Miram, and then they continued on through Italy and southern France. On the 23rd of April 1946, the New York Times reported that 2,283 German prisoners of war had fallen ill from poisoning, with 207 of them hospitalised and seriously ill. However, the operation ultimately caused no known deaths. According to documents obtained by a Freedom of Information request to the National Archives and Recording Administrator, the amount of arsenic found in the bakery was enough to kill approximately 60,000 prisoners. It is unknown why the poison failed, but it is suspected either to be that they spread the poison too thinly, or else the prisoners realised that the bread had been poisoned and did not eat very much. So there we go, the Jewish Avengers. Absolutely crazy story really. The need for revenge was warranted for the Nazis, so yeah, I would fully have supported Plan B. Plan A, on the other hand, well, in my view it was slightly excessive. Don't get me wrong, the Nazis deserved it. They did, but to go after women and children, and the elderly, makes you no better than them. Like I said, I'm definitely not playing down the German atrocities. They were repugnant. They did kill innocent men, women and children. But where does it stop? Though, with plan B, to go through all of that and not kill anyone, just sums up the whole thing really, doesn't it? Like I said earlier, I hadn't heard of this story up until recently, and I was shocked that a group actually tried this. I always thought that some of the SS members disappeared to America, Russia or South America. Some were executed, and the rest were released and lived their lives free. Possibly I looked at this with a little slight naivety. Or is it not widely known in the West, as were made to see Jewish people just as victims of the Holocaust, rather than how they've been seen throughout history? Now, that sentence sounds like a loaded gun. But look through history. You have Tiberius expelling Jews from Rome way back in 19 CE. Countless sources of massacres against them. God knows Jewish people have been persecuted for millennia. But the Holocaust was the persecution to end all persecutions. Anyway, if you like this episode, drop us a five-star review. If you think friends and family may like this, share it with them. Links to TikTok, YouTube, Insta and the show email are below. If you've been listening for a while, why not subscribe? Please do it, that way you never miss an episode. So with all that out of the way, please join me for episode 16 and more. Dark history.